Good morning and welcome to St. Thomas's online worship. My name is Kevin Bothwell and I am here at Stony Lake this morning. We're not quite back in St. Catharines yet, but I did say that I would be doing a service for today, so here we are. Thank you very much for joining us, whether you're watching on Kojiko TV or whether you are watching on YouTube and wherever you are in the world. We are really glad to have you with us. We just take a moment and take a deep breath several times and let it out several times and just be quiet. Let's be in God's presence as we begin this morning. Would you join me please in prayer? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Generous God, you give us gifts and make them grow. Though our faith is small as a mustard seed, make it grow to your glory and the flourishing of your kingdom. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 30. And I'll warn you, there is a chunk of this Gospel reading missing. You can go and look that up for yourself to see what the lectionary has left out. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized Jesus and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. For the last couple of weeks, we have been reading from Mark's Gospel. And Mark's Gospel is its a bit chunky. It doesn't make a, a really good novel, in a sense, because there, there's not a lot of filler. It's sort of action all the time. So we get a lot of pieces in Mark's Gospel where Jesus has healed someone or perhaps calmed a storm, and then immediately he goes on to do something else. That's a little difficult to uh, follow in the sense of following a novel, but I think, in my opinion, and this is only my opinion, so uh, take it for what it's worth, I think maybe the chunkiness, the choppiness of Mark's gospel is because people who went out and preached this gospel did it by filling in some of the blanks. Now, not speaking for God, because you know this is God's word to us, but by fleshing out the story a bit with bits and pieces that would make a little more, um, or give people hearing it, a little more chance to get attached to the story. So just to recap for you, we uh, began this sort of 
series of readings in the middle of Gar Mark's Gospel with a story about uh, Jesus going out on the water with his disciples. Uh, a storm comes up and the disciples say to him, don't you care that we're drowning here? And the chaotic nature of wind and uh, water waves is well known to anyone who sails on the lake or perhaps even boats on the lake. Um, it seems to me that uh, wind without waves is not possible, but wind by itself is not as big an issue. Uh, waves by themselves are not as big an issue. But when you get both those rather chaotic elements coming at the same time, that can be quite dangerous and quite dangerous even on a fairly small lake like Stony. Jesus has some kind of power and authority over those elements because he stilled them. In the next story, we heard how Jesus also has um, some kind of power and direct authority over things that um, bother human beings. So we had a woman who had had a hemorrhage, hemorrhage for uh, many, 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 many years. Um, I'm surprised that she could even walk. She must have been absolutely exhausted, but she's able to touch Jesus' cloak. That story is wrapped around um, the story of Jairus, whose daughter has died. And the interesting thing about that is that Jesus shows um, some kind of uh, power over both human health from the sense of something that's bothering us and death because he took Jairus' daughter, uh, who was just a young girl, and raised her from the dead. The other interesting thing about that story is that even though Jairus was the rich and powerful and uh, Roman ruler person in this story, the woman who gets healed first is the outcast, the one who nobody wanted to be near. The one who um, had been, was so unclean because of her years and years and years of hemorrhaging uh, that nobody would want her in the household because she would make everybody else unclean. She gets healed first. And in God's kingdom, that's always the case. The least among us get healed first. Then we find out that when Jesus goes back to Nazareth, that faith has a component in all this, that Jesus wasn't able to do any deeds of power because the people in Nazareth didn't have faith in him. They, they just doubted him. As many of us doubt, you know, uh, politicians and superstars and things like that, prophets in our own world, we say, well, you know, who's David Suzuki? It's just a science teacher who happened to get a job with the CBC and come, become famous. The problem is that when then we discount what he is saying, and that is dangerous because David Suzuki and Greta Thunberg and people like that are prophets. This week, uh, we find that Jesus is doing something a little bit different. Now, this week's reading from the Gospel of Mark is a bit chopped up. There are bits and pieces missing from this because we're going to get back to them later on in the lectionary season. I always think that's too bad because really the Gospels are written in a particular way to help us come to know Jesus Christ, not just as a list of things, you know, like Son of God and um, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, uh, and He shall reign forever and ever. I won't try and sing it, but not just to get to know Him in point form, but to get to know Jesus as a member of Jewish society at the time, and as someone interacting in a world where the same kinds of pressures are exhibited as often are exhibited in our world. So at one point, Jesus is looking at the crowd who has followed him around uh, the lake. Now, we don't know this because it was read this morning. We just know if you go back and read uh, chapter 6 of Mark's Gospel that Jesus has just fed them. So they are following him because they have just been fed by him. They go to the other side of the lake because food was fairly scarce in, in, in that place at that time. And who wouldn't want another meal? He looks at them. Jesus looks at them and he says, you know, these people are like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, no one is leading them. No one is grounding them in their faith 
No one is leading them in a spiritual sense. They are caught up in all kinds of things that preoccupy human beings and still preoccupy human beings. You know, pre-COVID, if you looked at some of the uh, uh, traffic cameras going into Toronto or going into Hamilton or whatever, sheep without a shepherd, my goodness, people are zooming in and out and trying to get one car length ahead and all that kind of thing. People are trying to buy the latest um, piece of equipment the latest smartphone, the latest iPad, whatever. Sheep without a shepherd, because that's not what is really important in life. I was reading the other day that some of those lineups, this one was talking about people who wanted to buy the latest Xbox uh, in the United States. Some of those lineups even spawn violence as people jostle for position to get in and get the latest Xbox. Now, there's nothing wrong with the latest Xbox, but when I see stories like that, when I hear stories like that, I think of sheep without a shepherd because those are not the most important things in our lives. Jesus looks at them with compassion because they were sheep without, because they appeared to be sheep without a shepherd. And that word compassion is really interesting. It comes from two Latin words, com and passio. Com meaning with, passio meaning passion. And it's the same sense of passion that we get in um, Holy Week, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to, uh, you know, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, whoever. It means suffering. Jesus looked at them with suffering. Not just with pity, with suffering. The other night I was uh, having dinner over at Hobart's at McCracken's Landing, and uh, although I should have been paying attention to the stories uh, that were going on at the table because it was my wedding anniversary and we were joined by friends for that, I was actually watching the TV monitor behind everyone because they were playing baseball highlights. And I like watching baseball. And at one point, a fielder goes uh, way out to catch a ball and he reaches way up to catch this ball and as he does that, he slams his hip into a metal railing, a metal fence that was guarding a, a path going down underneath the stadium. I could feel that. I'm a fairly heavy guy, but even I don't have a lot of padding on my hip bones. I could feel that guy hit that. It was probably a week old by the time I saw it, but I could feel it. I could feel it in my gut. That gut feeling is what Jesus is feeling here. Now, why is that important? I could go on and on about the story itself, but why is that important? So we know that Jesus has this power and authority over all kinds of things in the world that, that plague us. But we also now know from Mark that Jesus feels our suffering. Are you someone who is really worried about how the world is going to unfold after COVID? Are you someone who has been struggling with keeping your business going, keeping the family going, uh, struggling with doing your work and having the kids at home as well and having to help them do their schoolwork? So you've now got, if you're a woman, you've got three jobs. You've got a house to look after because most guys are not great about contributing. Not all guys, some guys. You've got kids to help. And you've got your own job to do. And all of a sudden, life has become complicated. Are you worn out because of that? Jesus is suffering with you. I'm not sure that any of us can snap our fingers and solve that problem, although it will eventually go away. Are you suffering from depression? Or are you consumed by the overwhelming nature of the world around us? Buildings collapsing in Florida, terrible things happening in East Africa, famine threatening in several places around the world, heat waves happening in British Columbia. I read the other day that uh, almost half the number of people that have died from COVID-19 in British Columbia, whatever that number is, died during the heat wave of heat exposure. 
We're not taught to look after ourselves. Are you overwhelmed? Jesus is looking at you with compassion. The answer, or at least the thing that I take from all this, is that we do not believe in a God who is simply out there, who is simply disconnected from our lives. Anglicans and Christians all over the world believe in a God who is walking with, the, walking with us through this. And that makes all the difference to me. When I'm in crisis, it really helps me to know that my wife Tony is, is with me. I would assume the same thing goes for her. When I'm in crisis, it really helps me to talk to some of my friends and say, you know, I'm struggling with this. When I'm in a crisis that nobody else can help with, it helps me to know that Jesus is not only there, but is suffering with me in these things. And I take great comfort from that. And so should all of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God bless all of us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that we may live from deep within ourselves and deep within the hearts that God has given us. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of God's creation, so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears, tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, and hunger, for those who live in war, for those who are afraid to be in the world and let us know who they really are, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain and their uncertainty into joy. And may God bless all of us with just enough foolishness to believe that we can actually make a difference in this world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all and especially to those around us who are poor, not only financially, but also emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And may God bless you as we all do that together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.